Hey guys, um, so my name's Peter and I'm going to talk to you guys today about rapidly producing real world IoT projects. Um, so my background, I work at Microsoft as a technical solutions professional for Azure app development. And my uh, background before joining Microsoft was actually electrical engineer. So when I joined Microsoft, I kind of naturally fell into um, trying to do some IoT projects. I've been at Microsoft a relatively short time. Um, I started kind of uh, December, well, I started this role in December. I was in previous roles. But my, um, and today, basically, the basis of this talk is a project I did um, for the Microsoft Technology Center. And it's a, it's a pretty cool project, but effectively, um, it's a customer tracking solution. Um, which was developed in three days for a budget of about $1,200. And I'll dive into that a lot more. So the overall agenda for this talk is for me to uh, give you a few examples of IoT use case. This talk itself will be um, presented at the Azure Boot Camp in Sydney in um, April 27th. If you're around, please come to that. Um, so any feedback for this would be fantastic, and I'll um, change up my talk accordingly. But the agenda for this talk is, um, yeah, I'll go through some current IoT use cases. Just to baseline it, it's meant to be a level 200 talk. There are a few Azure IoT technologies. Then I'll go into the problem and how it was solved using open source technology and the Azure um, IoT stack. And then I'll go through the architecture, a bit of code, and hints and tricks for how you guys can um, potentially build something really cool. So first up, what is IoT? Well, IoT being the Internet of Things, uh, if you look on Urban Online Dictionary, it's the objects with computing devices in them that are able to connect to each other and exchange using the Internet. But everyone here has an IoT device, and that's uh, people's, your phone, effectively. And these days, IoT devices are popping up everywhere. Chips are getting smaller, um, devices are getting smarter. You're going to have a smart fridge soon. Um, your microwave could have an um, IoT device. Um, your car, if you buy a car these days, everything seems to be getting connected to the internet. So where's this all coming from? So um, looking back um, in terms of like a small bit of history of IoT is really a kind of uh, people put it back to some people put it back further, but the majority of people I saw blogging about were talking about 1992, with Microsoft at work connecting stuff to the internet. And then this idea from um, 1999 popped up called in the embedded internet. And that was really where the concept of IoT uh, came from. And then it changed name in 2009 to um, the Internet of Things. And by 2020, we're expected to have up to 8 billion connected devices. Now, that's about the same amount of people in the world. That's, that's one IoT device per person. That's, that's absolutely staggering. And this is why I just love the space, is it's such a big, growing space, because these numbers are just exponential. Um, and so if, because I'm from Microsoft, I can't not talk about Microsoft's um, perception and uh, ideology around the IoT space. So Microsoft, with Microsoft's mission statement, um, to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. I really hope I crowed that right. Um, but effectively, where we see the space at the moment is the early adopters only make up about 15% of the market, of the, um, of the enterprise market. So there's still 85% of companies that have not even considered IoT. And out of that 15%, it's um, seen at the moment, this year, uh, as a $130 billion um, opportunity for those 15% that have taken it. This opportunity is going to grow to, um, by 2022, it's to grow to $440 billion do opportunity. So that's kind of like the business, business case behind it. And on average, and from like the, the business standpoint, the idea of collecting more data, we're able to uh, produce better products for our customers, get better feedback, do um, predictive maintenance, and produce better products uh, for our customers. So that's that's why, like, this is just such an exciting industry, and well, this is why I'm pretty passionate about it. So I'll just go through a couple of examples of where it's appearing in industry at the moment before I jump into uh, my particular use case. So in the retail industry, it's uh, popping up in stores and you're going to be able to walk into a store. Um, and it's, of course, mixing with AI. So you'd be able to walk into a store and um, 
effectively will recognize you as a 22 year old uh, male and then it will advertise you accordingly. Um, th then in say energy industry, uh, smart meters just are uh, wasting less electricity, less fossil fuels because they know when, when it's required, when all, when all that energy is required. Uh, so less waste overall. Uh, transportation would really be Tesla. I believe um, the other week, actually, in terms of news, um, that Tesla is um, being updated, and this is kind of cloud to device, um, where they've pushed, pushed, updated the system on the Teslas to be able to change lanes without uh, driver interference, which is really, really very cool. Um, in terms of the agriculture industry, it's about having sensors in the soil, knowing when to water your plants, which is reducing waste of water, but yet increasing yield. And overall, like all of these things, um, are also the, having predictive maintenance on top of them. And basically any industry you think of is trying to do something with predictive maintenance. And that's understanding when something's going to break and then fixing it before it breaks. So the, lots of exciting things happening. These are some other uh, use cases that Microsoft have, um, uh, are using and that um, like you can look them up online. I'll actually go through a little bit on the Rolls-Royce one uh, today. Uh, but effectively Rolls-Royce, although I, um, I know them for cars, they also do amazing airplane engines. Uh, Different company, actually. Uh, They've yes. never been the same company for decades. Okay, I, I didn't know that. But effectively, the, um, in this example, it's about the airplane engines. And effectively what happened is, um, let me just get out of that so you can see my screen. All right, so effectively, Rolls-Royce started putting all these sensors, every sensor you can imagine, into their airplane engines. Um, temperature, participation, um, what, tension, any, anything you can imagine, they've basically got in these airplane engines. And then they came to Microsoft and they said, what can we do with all this data? So then they started, um, they put it on a sort of Power BI dashboard and then they put some smarts on top of it. And this is um, the actual dashboard that they use. This is a, um, like anyone can log, log into this with anything. And this will be an example of what they do. Um, and effectively, how does it look on the, uh, it's a little bit crunched up there. But um, effectively, this is an example of what some of the data looks like. They'll have um, really nice dashboards. It's a little bit scrunched up due to the resolution on the screen, unfortunately. But if you get a chance, uh, definitely try and Google the uh, Rolls-Royce uh, Microsoft demo. And effectively, the way it works is that when the airplanes come in and they land at the airport, when they pull up to the gate, they'll upload all the data from the um, engines accordingly. Um, and then that will be overlaid on here. And then it allows people to dig in. Unfortunately, due to our resolution issues, um, it will tell you, it will actually warn you um, of, it will actually, the predictive maintenance will warn you accordingly. So, yeah, on the top of there, there's actually a warning. And uh, down the bottom, the reason that there is a warning is it's also managing fuel and it's realized that this, this airplane in particular may not have enough fuel for the next flight. Um, so it's popping up with that and the reason that this is so important is if there's unscheduled um, maintenance or unscheduled fueling of any plane, um, the flow on effects are up to a million dollars cost in revenue uh, for the company. Is you've got to, um, all their customers, they've got to renegotiate, put them on new flights. Um, so the ability to be able to track everything that's happening with your engine and with your plane uh, means there's no longer unscheduled uh, maintenance in theory. Um, then on top of that, they're actually collecting um, information on fuel use and this fuel use uh, training is being used as training data and sold back to the uh, pilot. So it kind of uh, changes the business model as well, which is uh, very cool. Um, so I won't draw on that any more longer, but definitely have a, unfortunately the resolution doesn't give this site, um, it doesn't do the site justice. So if you get a chance, check it out. It's a, a very cool, uh, cool website. I'll show you one more, um, one more link.
and I'll try and make my flyers available so you guys can have a look through them as well. But depending what industries you're on, if you're ever curious uh, what's currently happening in your industry, um, say if you're the power industry or if you're uh, working for uh, farming, um, effectively the, there's, this, there's a website that's up that from Microsoft showing use cases and case studies around um, each industry. And it is safe. I don't know why it's saying this. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to continue anyway. Um, but say if you're, um, and it's just to give you guys a few ideas of uh, what's currently happening in your industries. Uh, you can once again sign in with anything. And these are all public facing sites, of course. That's why I can sign in with anything. Um, this one, this one resolution is looking a lot better. Um, but say airplanes, it comes up with the Rolls Royce demo. Then um, down here in power, Schindler's Electric, what they're currently doing with that um, in the IoT space. Then uh, yep, farming, it's got an example here, scatter farm. Um, so just to give you a few ideas. So I'll jump back to the actual slides now and I'll continue on. Uh, from outside. Yeah. Um, so as I used uh, Microsoft's Azure Stack for my project, um, I'm going to give you a bit of baseline of some of the tools I used before I go into the solution. So first up, when I think IoT with Azure, I think IoT Hub. So um, IoT Hub is effectively a message broker, and it allows authentication with your devices and you to. Um, manage your devices accordingly. So when you put your device, when you set up your devices on IoT Hub, you get authentication keys to try and guarantee the security of those devices. Um, and this is what I've uh, kind of, this is what I've done. There's also two tiers I want to point out. There's the basic tier and the standard tier, but um, there's also a free tier. The free tier, which is what I use for my project, gives you up to 8,000 messages a day. Um, and it gives you everything from the standard tier. And you can both do, you can do um, device to cloud and cloud to device. And it allows for um, IoT, IoT Edge, which I'll jump in as well. That is on a separate slide because it's a pretty big point. So what is IoT Edge? IoT Edge um, allows people to um, run, run programs. So for, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. Um, if you make a machine learning model to uh, recognize a fox from a dog and you decide to set up a camera in the bush, uh, you could potentially send every time there's movement or every time there's a potential fox or dog, potentially you could um, take a picture and send it to the cloud and it will tell you if it's a fox or dog. That's IoT Edge allows you to train this model and then push it down to the device. So then instead of um, always making that call, to the cloud, it runs the program locally and it will only send off, oh, this is a fox, every time it sees a fox. It won't send up, it will recognize it's a fox on the device, it won't um, send up all the information. And that really saves on bandwidth. But the other major advantage of um, IoT Edge is the ability to push programs from the cloud down to the device. So uh, even with, when dealing with Raspberry Pis, um, you've got uh, you can put an IoT Edge client on your Raspberry Pi, and there's actually IoT Edge um, devices out in the market you can purchase. And it allows you to um, effectively, once you write your program, you can containerize it, and then you can push it uh, down to your device. And that this is really solving the problem for um, scalability for your IoT projects, because you're not going to um, walk around to each device individually and change the um, software on it. It's just not feasible um, when you scale out. So th this is one of Microsoft's answers to scalability um, in terms of IoT projects. And one other one I want to give a um, shout out to, I didn't use this in my project, but the Azure Sphere is a very exciting piece of technology. This came out uh, last year. Effectively, it's a um, chip that was made, uh, designed by Microsoft, and the schematic's kind of been uh, open sourced. So there's partners that are developing boards around it. Uh, we want to reduce the, um, and it's, yeah, so effectively, the idea being it's super secure, that one centimeter by one centimeter chip has Wi-Fi on it and has um, encryption on it. So this is, this is Microsoft's answer to how can you um, secure your, how can you have IoT 
secure IoT from the chip onwards. And what is MCU? What is MCU? MCU. Ah, uh, where sorry? Intuium Solutions securing MCU powered devices. Um, I'm not sure what MCU stands for. Okay, control unit. Micro control unit. Okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, effectively. Yeah, it's a very exciting piece of technology. It came out last year. There's a lot of developments in this field. Um, and they're trying to rapidly reduce the price of the chip to make it um, scalable in the market. So if, now I'll jump into um, what my project was. But first, I need to tell you a bit about the Microsoft Technology Center. So the Microsoft Technology Center opened up in Sydney uh, recently at the uh, beginning of this year. And it's effectively a center kind of invite only for enterprise corporations. And it depends on your um, industry. So if you're retail based, they'll set up the center accordingly to show all of the um, Microsoft solutions for the retail solutions, or they'll set up um, and they'll set up the partner solutions. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other things that they do there, but they were, they were going to open at the beginning of this year. And what they were kind of lacking was a way, a way to kind of automate the um, invitation and check-in process for our customers. And also the digitalization of how, how do you track uh, what customers are interested in. So a customer would go in there and they would see, say, six demos. So um, ideally, we want some sort of digital way to track if they're interested in which demos they're interested in, which demos they want more information on. Um, so that was the problem. That was the problem that came up to us. And <clears throat> how can we digitally track customers' uh, interests and try and automate some of that follow-up, as well as kind of the check-in solution? And so the first thing you do when you present with a problem like this is you try to explore the market. So we, um, so we got a bunch of quotes. And the quotes are coming up um, was going to be uh, lead time about two to four months. And it was going to be cost between $100,000 and $200,000. And so that was a bit, um, at this time, the MTC was going to open uh, pretty soon. I think it was probably a month and a half or so. Um, so we wanted something uh, without a lead time of four months. And we want something a little bit cheaper. So they basically came up to myself and another technical solutions professional and asked, uh, can you make something cheaper using uh, Microsoft's uh, technology? And being me being um, only been around for like a month and a half or so in this role, um, I said, of course, um, see how we go. Um, so to do so, um, we automatically kind of jumped to kind of open source technology. The only way you can do um, something so quickly in my, in my mind was to kind of leverage what was already there. Um, so we went through the closet and we found a bunch of Raspberry Pis. We thought maybe this will work. Um, and we knew that the Raspberry Pis have um, RFID, they, they're the good RFID libraries with them. Um, and the reason we kind of went with this, for one, the, the cost wasn't too much. Say for one, um, for one of these, it uh, cost about $93 or so. And this just came off one sec. Uh, $93 or so. Um, the overall cost for the entire system, as mentioned earlier, was about $1,200. But yeah, the cost was, cost was low. We thought development would be quick. And there's a lot of open source libraries. And why we particularly chose Linux for this is um, plenty of open source projects. Because yes, there is um, IoT, there's Windows 10 Core, which um, you can use like .NET and everything on. But um, we want something proof uh, that was proved in like a very strong community around the open source. And then Python itself, uh, until like we'd been told, is like a relatively um, easy language to pick up. And so, for example, I'd never touched it before. I did about a day beforehand um, doing a bunch of tutorials. And then I started the project, and that seemed to be enough. So it was very fast. Um, fast time to get up. So the overall solution, um, I will show you the demos as well, but I'll just walk you through the customer journey. So the customer receives an email. This email has a QR code on it. They come into the center and they scan the QR code on a camera. This camera is connected to a Raspberry Pi. 
uh, which is eh. and then they scan, once they scan the QR code, they scan a RFID tag um, onto the Raspberry Pi. This RFID tag now has the customer's name and email associated with it. And then during, that, during the session, they walk around and every time they see something they like, they simply just tap and um, it, it puts that onto a database saying, I want more information on that, um, that demo. And at the end of the session, a email gets sent out and the customer receives all the follow-ups that they wanted. So I will show you the demo now as well, but I'll just talk, these are actual pictures from the uh, Microsoft Technology Center. So on the left, uh, you see kind of the check-in area. At the top is the actual camera, and then there's the uh, RFID scanner on the uh, right, and that's one of the demo stations, and you can see the, um, see the actual um, Raspberry Pi case there. So first up, if I'm coming in as a customer, um, actually, let's just jump out of here. And another piece of open source technology uh, when dealing with Azure, which with, when dealing with Azure um, IoT, which I really like, is called um, Device Explorer. And I'm definitely changing all my keys after this presentation. <laughs> so that's, so, but effectively what you do is you, um, you go to IoT Hub, you authenticate with IoT Hub, and then it will show you everything in your IoT Hub. So I have four, um, I have four devices associated with my IoT Hub. If I go for the check-in, I can click that and go monitor. And I'm not sure. So hopefully this will scan straight away. If not, I'll just jump to the, um, and it did. So now, so I've come in as a customer. You're not expected to see anything there yet, don't worry. Uh, you come in as a customer, um, you've scanned your RFID tag. You're like, I'm meant to be here. You scan it. This tag, this bed has your email and uh, your name associated with it. And then the receptionist will just walk up and um, tap accordingly. This now is associated with you. And it sent a message to IoT Hub saying that you've checked in. So if you look down at the breakdown of the message, uh, my name is not Peter Legend. Um, that was just one of the person that made the QR code. Um, but effectively it made, it, it sent my name, it sent my email, and it said check in, yes, to, um, the C to IoT Hub. And now if I cancel this and I jump into a read, let's say I'm a customer and I'm walking around, Um, and I decide I really love this um, demo over here. I purely just have to scan it. And once again, it is now you can see the device name has changed, is now read one. And the uh, name is still giving my name and it's still giving my email. And that's, that is sent to IoT Hub, uh, basically instantaneously, as you can see there. Um, so I will continue on, I'll show you the architecture behind all this. So this is, this is the overall architecture uh, that it came up with. Um, this, was, this was done in practically three days. And the reason it was done so quickly is there's not much coding that's actually happening here. Um, talking, and I'll, I'll talk about a few of the services. Um, first up, uh, before I split this off, the flick button, I just want to shout, I want to shout out two um, services here, and then I'll dig deep into the architecture. Uh, because what I realized from a talk I did earlier um, is not too many people know about the flick button and that was, that was a use case. So if I scroll here, um, on below the camera, uh, you can see a white and a black button. Those become pretty useful a bit later. I just want to point those out. So effectively the flick button, which is used, um, is a it's a Wi-Fi, well, Bluetooth-enabled device which sends an HTTP request to a, a web page. And the, it, oh, that's all it does. Now, I'm using it as a trigger to just say, I've been pressed. Um, and they're pretty cheap. You can get them for about uh, $20, I believe, uh, online. Although I think you have to buy them like, in packs of three or so. And they're super useful, and I do use this in the demonstration. 
uh, in, and in the architecture, and it'll make a lot more sense than pointing this out now. Second one I just want to point out is Flow. If you've never heard of Flow, um, effectively it's similar to Logic Apps, or um, if that, then this, where um, effectively you have your trigger. In this case, it's a flick button. And you have um, a bunch of actions that have happened afterwards. And these actions are, these are basically using Flow or using Logic Apps. These are connectors, uh, which you just tell them to point places. Uh, sorry, I yep. have a question. Uh, why, why did you use Flow over Logic Apps? Yep. Uh, the reason Flow for this particular scenario uh, was the connector with um, the email. Uh, it was much easier to use in Flow. Um, but I, ideally, for production, you'd want to be using Logic Apps. Um, they should be more or less the same. There's just a few little tweaks. And I was being a bit lazy and decided that the uh, Flow one was a bit easier. Thanks. All good. And so just I'll point out this, what this flow is doing. Effectively, when the button is pressed, it is grabbing um, everything from the, the query from the SQL database. It's uh, grabbing the information, and it's just putting it into the email. So this is the final step in the process. But I'll dig deep into the architecture now. I just wanted to point out those two services so the rest of the architecture will make more sense to you. So first up, the invitation. So what's happening here? The facilitator, um, one thing, we really want to make this user friendly. The facilitator is not going to go on Azure and code something. So we made it um, so she would, they would just fill in an Excel spreadsheet with the customer's name and with the customer's email. And this was done on OneDrive. As soon as they saved it on OneDrive, that's a trigger in the flow. And what that trigger does is it pulls the information out from the um, Excel spreadsheet, and it puts it into the SQL database. Right? That's all that top, top section does. The set bottom section, once the facilitator is happy and decides, all right, I should, I should actually invite these people, um, she decides to press the first flick button. This is a trigger for a flow, which, uh, uses, which initiates um, container instances that, which is actually pulled from container registry. And in that, that's basically C-sharp coding, uh, which just generates a QR code. And that's pulling the information from the database to generate that QR code, puts it out into a storage blob, and then it gets put into an email for another flow. So these are all, in terms of coding, really the only coding happening here was the container registry. Everything else was kind of connections. And the second section, uh, the check-in process I just showed you. Uh, when, sorry, when um, everything's going through IoT Hub. So the same, the same kind of process happens between the customer interest and the customer um, check-in. Everything goes through IoT Hub, and then Stream Analytics is what sorts it. Stream Analytics is the smarts. And Stream Analytics, I'll dig into that a bit deeper, but it's uh, basically a SQL. Um, uh, filter. And then that will sort it and put it into tables in the SQL database. And then when the facilitator is happy, the session's over, uh, she'll say, they will say, um, I might, might as well uh, send off those final emails. And all, she, all they have to do is uh, just click the button, another button, um, and it will automate those emails out. So kind of in summary of why um, like the comparison of this solution to what was potentially on the market that they could have pulled in. Um, $1,200, it's uh, reasonably cheap. Most of that was all hardware. Um, we had about, what about seven stations kind of set up. Um, and it, we did it, we did it in basically three days. Um, and you compare that to what was currently on the market for what we needed, it was going to cost between $100,000 and $200,000 and take two to four months. So it was in, the, in this use case, it was definitely worth uh, trying to use the open source and connect that with IoT for the solution. In terms of use cases... Um, Question. Yeah. yeah. Did that three-day execution include all your build and install time, uh, or was it... Uh, just the design and build of the prototype. Well, that that was that was everything. So that was a fully working system with uh, half a dozen or whatever. Uh, we we didn't have. I think we had probably the first two or three pies working. 
um, and then it was just the same code for the rest of them. Yeah. And then the uh, use case, um, say the automation of the invitation system, um, inviting someone, like er every company, these are, these are extended use cases of what you could use this for. I mean, every company needs some way to invite and track their customers effectively. Uh, you could potentially, uh, you can use this technology to do so uh, very easily. And ha have you guys ever been in a meeting room and realized you haven't booked it? And you're sitting there trying to rapidly um, book that, go through Outlook and book the room before someone else comes in? You could potentially have it so you walk in um, and you just scan the RFID tag as you walk in to book the room. Because it's just, it's just a um, straight link to the SQL database. So I'm, I'm going to dive a bit further now into how I actually built the solution and where all this, all this came from. It's not magic at all. <laughs> and I, I do realize this is a .NET meetup, so you guys might hate me a little bit because I'm using Raspberry Pis. Um, but for this, for this use case, it just made sense. Um, so one, one, a couple of things I want to point out is those RFID scanners, for me to get the libraries um, to add, read and write onto this machine, um, it was just two simple commands, sudo pip install spy dev and sudo pip install mfrc522, which is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. And all the information that I used, and I'm going to exit this so I can show you the actual website. Let's give that a moment to load. Um, the open source, the documentation is kept very up to date. Let me just get out of there. Hopefully that's all right. Um, this, is, this is basically the documentation that I went off. Um, the first section of it is just setting up your Pi, which is pretty standard. Uh, there is the hardware instructions for how to pin. Where these are your pin layouts. It even gives you a nice diagram of how to do it. Um, and then you just need to make sure your Pi is up to date. Um, and down the bottom is when I start installing my spy dev. There's the command I'm talking about. There's the other command. Those are your two libraries. Now, um, to read and write, that must be pretty complex, right? You'd think wrong. Uh, so basically down here, to write, uh, this is all you need. It's, what, 10, 15 lines less of code, uh, which is just crazy. And then to read, it's basically the same amount of lines to code. So that was, that was very simple. So suddenly, at this stage, I have a um, RFID read and scan, like pretty, pretty simple setup. Um, but the next step, it's, oh, I need to connect this to IoT Hub. So on that point, Sorry, it jumps out a bit. Give me a minute. Um, you would expect you'd expect um, a connection to be like relatively hard, but because Microsoft's one of the biggest contributors of GitHub in terms of open source projects, um, we, we've put so much out there. It's actually only about twenty-five lines of code to connect your Raspberry Pi. Uh, device client to the cloud. And on top of that, you don't actually have to know it. Um, it's, all, it's all out there for you. And I'll, I'm, I'll show you two more links, uh, which is going to be the Python client sample, and it will be the Microsoft samples for client as well. So this is the link that I basically used. Effectively, my whole project in terms of coding for, your, um, for the hardware piece for the cloud was the combination of this, of the first tab I showed you, and this tab. So download this project, um, and you change it accordingly. This one was, I think, doing a temperature sensor. And they had the entire um, library, and the, you just change the connection key and paste your code in effectively uh, to rig it up. Now, the other thing I want to point out is to actually get a IoT client on your Raspberry Pi device, 
once again, it's one line of code. sudo pip install Azure IoT Hub device client. And you have the IoT Azure device client on your Raspberry Pi. That's insanely simple. And if, if Python's not your thing, we do have fantastic documentation on um, other languages which go through basically the same project. Um, so this one's doing it with C, node.js, and so on. And yeah, so I'll continue from there. Uh, from Oh, I should have done that. Um, I will show you my IoT hub uh, very shortly. Um, and a few things on Azure, including uh, my stream analytics and the code I had for that. And I am making the entire project, um, I am making the project open source. But say if I want to authenticate, sorry for switching like this. I didn't realize how many links there were. Yeah, so just let that run for a second. But um, I've been working on the wikis as well um, and trying to write out all the steps on this, on how this project's going to work. Um, so there's two things I'm going to show you there, which will be the, um, which will be the Stream Analytics and IoT Hub. So this is the Azure portal uh, for me to get to my resource groups. Um, I'll just filter my subscriptions first. I did. I replicated this from the Microsoft Technology Center, so I don't have everything with me. But, yes, let that load. RFID demo. And effectively, your resource group is just where you want to keep um, your entire project. So once you're done, you can just delete it. It's a great way to manage it on, um, on Azure. And in terms of what I was talking about before, in terms of the IoT Hub, how easy it is to set up a device and get that authorization key. For people that have never used IoT Hub, I'll just show you quickly how to do that. So the, remember, I'm using this for the free tier as well. So you scroll down, and you can find your IoT devices down here. Let's let that load. And I have four devices connected to this account. Um, but if I just want to make a new device, I simply have to go add, put in whatever I want the device to be, uh, net user group two. Um, and then it will simply authenticate, it will um, generate those authentication keys for me. I'm going to change all of these keys <laughs> uh, security-wise. Although, because I'm on the free tier, it won't, it won't hurt me too much if someone. <laughs> That's not a challenge, though. <laughs> but yes, effectively, there's my primary key, there's my secondary key. And then I'll jump to my stream analytics section. And basically, you'd copy and paste one of those keys into the code that's already provided to you from the open source projects. And it's um, and Bob's your uncle. You're connected to um, IoT Hub. Um, and I'll jump down to my stream analytics. So as I just said earlier, and I showed you earlier in my architecture, everything that went through IoT Hub uh, went through stream analytics. And I just want to jump in here and edit queries so you can see it a bit better. Effectively. Um, and this is kind of how simple Stream Analytics is. It's using uh, SQL language. And effectively, I'm just selecting, um, I'm just selecting uh, the name as the customer name. So that'd be uh, Peter Legend in this case. Um, ID as RFID. The reason I'm doing this is because it's going to put it into a SQL database. And I've named those as my entities. Um, email is email and such not. And the filter I've done is just to check where um, I'm checking the name of my device to see what it's called. And I'm saying if it's, check, if it's not uh, check in right, then, um, then do this. And then further down, I'm basically just doing the opposite. 
uh, where it is check and write, do that. And I'm sending it to my SQL database. Um, my blob storage, although that's not in the architecture, that's just to have a history of everything. Um, and I didn't end up doing the Power BI one. But that's, that's honestly, what, 30 lines of code? 32 lines of code? And that's all you need for a filter. And there's lots of space there. There's a few things commented out, so it's probably a lot less than that. Awesome. So I'm going to jump back in from current slide. Yeah. There's a question on the stream there. What's the input into the stream analytics? Is it HTTP call um, with JSON or the like? Ah, uh, JSON. Yeah. Um, so in terms of this project, for future developments. Um, ideally, for me to scale this, I'd want um, to containerize everything I have currently on the pies, and then I'll be able to push it, push it back out with IoT Edge. Um, and I'd also want to do it with cheaper hardware. I'm not, I'm not gonna scale Raspberry Pis, and, uh, in, and that would allow me to scale the project. And the way, the way I'd probably do it is I would um, go down and start with Arduinos. I, I've already had a look around, and I've seen some libraries with um, RFID scanners, um, which seem, seem doable. And I've seen some already connections to IoT Hub um, open source as well with Arduinos. And be me with a electrical engineering background, um, I would probably end up, um, once I have it working with Arduino, probably lift and shift and grab one of the chips and redesign a board around that chip. And then I'd have a $100,000 uh, product. Uh, not quite, but the, the, the point of this, and in terms of hints and tricks, I've left, uh, there's a few, a lot of open source uh, repositories out there uh, for you to do a similar project. Um, so hopefully this has kind of like inspired you. And there's even some .NET ones out there. Um, there's one on C Sharp for connecting to IoT. There's, um, and this is the Raspbian, Raspbian one as well, if you want to run uh, .NET on your uh, Raspbian Pi. And I'm also making my uh, repository, like I'm updating everything there as well. Um, so that will hopefully be open source by the end of the week. Uh, so you guys will be able to grab my code and do as you want with it. Uh, so my call to action for you guys is I kind of challenge you. I mean, if, if only 15% of enterprise uh, customers are currently doing IoT projects, there's 85% of the market that haven't taken up stuff. There's plenty, plenty of IoT projects that people haven't thought of. And if I can do this in three days, um, or, and, my, and my team member, my team member and I, um, can achieve this in uh, three days, you guys can do so much more. And it, I, I, hopefully I showed you how simple it is. If you use the correct, um, the, the correct open source libraries and uh, technology and you know how to put a few things together, you can have an IoT project up and running in no time. So I'd really love some feedback on this talk, uh, what you liked, what you disliked. Um, I'll be presenting this again uh, later this month, so I'd love to be able to change it accordingly. But the, these are my details if you want to reach out to me. Awesome. Questions? Have you played with the Azure Sphere? I have not. They have one at the Microsoft Technology Center, but I haven't got my hands on it yet. Yeah. And I was just wondering about the um, Rolls-Royce. Sorry. Sorry, it's Linux-based, by the way, yep. that, um, which is very interesting because obviously from Microsoft background, everyone was expecting it to be a Windows-based uh, system. But Linux being so lightweight and Microsoft kind of turning towards open source, um, it ended up being a Linux um, piece of technology that we've come out well using. Thank you guys. <laughs>